Today, our classy car expert, Christoph Bauer, is hitting the road in a unique mix of car and boat. It's German engineers Hans Trippel's legendary Amphicar. As early as 1932, the self-taught automotive designer had converted his old DKW race car into an amphibious vehicle. But his most important creation was the Amphicar 770. Produced starting in 1961, it was the first series production amphibious vehicle made for private customers. Hans Trippel. Christoph says Hans Trippel was obsessed with creating an amphibious car and devoted his entire life to the idea. But Christoph says the passionate visionary did experience some setbacks, like in December 1934, when the car ended up at the bottom of the Rhine River during a test drive. But that very night, Trippel salvaged his waterlogged vehicle, and three days later, it was back on the road. Through all the highs and lows, he never let anything distract him from his vision. Trippel built his last amphibious car, prototype, in 1990, at the age of 81. Series production of the Amphi car began in 1961. Hans Trippel got financing from German industrialist Herbert Quandt. The amphibious car mainly targeted the U.S. market, which, as Christoph notes, was evident from its very name. He explains it was called the 770 because it could go around 7 miles per hour in water and 70 miles per hour on land. He thinks the car's a great idea and should have sold like hotcakes in the land of opportunity. The Amphicar's body was made in the northern German city of Lübeck, with the final assembly being done in Berlin. Production of 25,000 Amphicars was planned, but the initial reaction to the model was less than enthusiastic. Christoph quotes one of the first damning verdicts. The Amphicar combines the qualities of an impractical car with those of an impractical motorboat. He says that's cruel, but unfortunately true. He hasn't tried it in water yet, but even on land, driving down winding roads is enough to make you seasick. The little 1.1-liter rear-mounted engine from Triumph delivers just 38 horsepower, which doesn't make for much driving pleasure. And back in 1961, the Americans with their big V8 engines were used to something else entirely. Still, the Amphicar is a real beauty. <laughs> okay, that was a joke, Christoph admits. He thinks that the design's overly ambitious. Though well-intended, it looks half-baked. He admits there's some nice chrome trim and, of course, these generous tail fins as a nod to U.S. customers. The fins also serve to break any waves and protect the engine from getting flooded. The amphibious part, these two ship's propellers down here that drive the car in the water. The bottom part of the body is a completely sealed hole. And here in the doors, there are extra rubber seals to keep the water out. At least, that was the hope. Before the Amphicar was delivered to buyers, every single one was tested in a pool first to make sure it was watertight. Still, one look at the Amphicar's standard equipment, its water-breaking tail fins, raised exhaust pipe, and obligatory paddle doesn't exactly fill Kristoff with confidence. Will it float or won't it, he wonders. Now comes the exciting part. Here we go. It's very important to insert the navigation light here at the rear, especially when traveling at night. Then Christoph gets in and battens down the hatches. These little levers on the doors are to seal everything off completely. It's time to head for the water. And once he's in, he'll put it in neutral and engage the propellers using this stick shift. Fair winds and following seas. Oh, God. 
Oh, God, he says. It's a strange feeling driving a car into the water. It's floating. It's floating. Christoph simply can't believe it. Driving by its two ship's propellers, the Amphicar can achieve a speed of 6.5 knots, or roughly 12 kilometers an hour. The propellers have to be switched off as soon as it's back on dry land. Without the counter pressure of the water, they'd rotate far too fast and cause massive damage to the separate water transmission. Christoph honestly can't understand why you need a sport boat license to pilot the Amphicar in Germany, because it's hardly a sporty mode of transport, churning along so casually. Just turning it takes a lot of patience, because the steering only functions through the front wheels, and the turning circle is a whopping 35 meters. Though salt water could be corrosive, the Amphicar is even seaworthy. In 1962, four Britons crossed the English Channel in two Amphicars. It took them just under seven and a half hours. Getting into the water isn't a problem, but getting out can be. The 770 is a rear-wheel drive model, so the front wheels are of no help when it comes to navigating steep shorelines. Christoph says the vehicle's pretty high maintenance, too. After five hours in the water, there are a dozen spots that need greasing, and that's not his thing. In the 1960s, most potential buyers were of the same opinion. Of the 25,000 vehicles planned, just 3,878 were actually built, and production ceased altogether in 1968. Only a few Americans bought one, but Christoph thinks that's a real shame because as the first series production amphibious vehicle for private use, the Amphicar is definitely a milestone in automotive history. And great fun, too. At first, Christoph laughed at the Amphicar, but in the end, he wanted one himself. No wonder the model is prized by collectors and commands high prices. Amphicars in good shape can change hands for well over 50,000 euros.